Phil Jones. I'm in the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in Norwich in the United Kingdom. Well, I did a first degree in environmental sciences and then did a master's and a PhD in hydrology. And I finished in 1976. And in the UK, that was the height of the, um, the famous drought. And so the water companies were not doing any hiring that, in that year. And I was keen to get a job and I was applying for lots of jobs. And by chance, I, I got a job at the Climatic Research Unit here at the University of East Anglia on a three-year research contract. Then uh, 15 more years of short-term research contracts, I was finally taken on as a reader within the university system and uh, a professor a few years later. Now, that was, there was no planning in that. I, I was just a job at the time, and it, it has worked out quite well, I think. Uh, all things considered. Okay, well I, I came here in 1976 and the first bit of my work was not anything to do with the temperature record. It was, um, it was something else producing a, a, a quarterly magazine called Climate Monitor that, uh, that we produced for another 20 more years. But at the, at the time we'd, we'd just been in contact with several people at NCAR in, in Boulder, Colorado and learnt that they Someone in the US digitized something called World Weather Records, which is a masses of volumes of, of just temperature data and rainfall data from stations around the world. So we managed to get a magnetic tape, and uh, I had a program for my PhD which did um, interpolation of data across. This, this was just for a small part of Britain, and I was to apply that same program to the rest of the world. And we thought it was a good thing to do because we had some gridded data sets of other variables like pressure and we were looking at changes in pressure patterns around the world. We wanted to see how they in impact the him they impacted temperature and we're going to move on to precipitation later. And so the, f the first time we, we produced the, um, the land global temperature record was just to was just interpolating the station data. There was no check on the homogeneity of the data, the station quality. We were just using the available data and uh, we wrote up the to work for a paper in journal, journal of a monthly weather review then and um, we just did the northern hemisphere and we just did the land and one, one simple way of displaying the results was to produce a, a, a large-scale average for the northern hemisphere land areas but the whole aim was to produce a gridded data set to look at the patterns of change and relate those to patterns and other variables. And it's still been that. It's just that this, this, this one series has become a little bit iconic. Um, and later we moved on to the Southern Hemisphere, land again. And in the middle of the 1980s, we, we knew we'd um, not done anything with the marine data. So we uh, added that in, in jointly with some colleagues at the Met Office and that was then the first sort of truly global temperature record combining the both hemispheres and the marine parts of the world. Now people had done this before. I mean, at the same time, unbeknownst to us, Jim Hansen was doing something similar at, at GIS. It was land only, though. But if we, we, we actually reviewed who'd done it earlier. And um, several people had done it earlier. There was a Russian data set at the time there was uh, a guy called Murray Mitchell in the United States had done some work on this in the 1960s. There was a even earlier work in the late 1930s. Someone called Guy Stewart Callender produced the data set and he also looked at carbon dioxide measurements in, um, before the record at Mauna Loa started. And if you, even if you go way back, you find that um, the a guy called Vladimir Kirpin who also developed the Kirpin classification of climate, um, had produced a series in the 1880s. And in some more recent work, we've actually gone back and digitized some of the earlier series when people were clearly just working by hand. I think Murray Mitchell in the 60s probably had some sort of computer uh, calculator doing it, but Callender did it all by hand, and Kirpin certainly did. 
So we digitized their data and they agree amazingly well. I had a little paper out with Ed Hawkins um, a few uh, year or so ago because it was 75 years since Calendar's paper in 1938 last year and it was an amazing agreement with what Calendar did and Calendar this was just for the Northern Hemisphere or the land areas, but it was uh, Calendar was just using about four or five hundred stations around the world. And it just had annual averages, and we had sort of five thousand stations, and we were getting pretty much the same results. If we sort of look into to the future and how global temperatures might go, and the whole uh, idea of um, of climate change and the influence of humans on the climate system. When we started the work in, in the early 1980s, the temperature series then that we produced that finished in 1981 actually showed cooling from uh, the sort of late 1950s. So the 1960s were and early 70s were quite a cool period. There was some initial warmth coming in uh, in the in a couple of years in the early 80s, but we didn't really capture that in that data set. So when we started doing it, we didn't start it to look at, at um, sort of longer term change. We were trying to look at the reasons why you were getting some warm years and some cold years and the patterns of change around the world and could we relate those to the circulation. Obviously, having looked at the data a lot more now, you've found that obviously the very warm years are often, almost always, El Nino years and the very cold years are often La Nina years or, or, and the really cold summers in the Northern Hemisphere are volcanic years when we're responding to big eruptions like, uh, like Pinatubu. Um, so, but, but from the mid 80s onwards, uh, the science moved to more uh, climate change, global warming and, uh, and models and climate models but you always need the observations to provide some way of checking the models. It wasn't just the models in isolation. You had the observations checking how they're doing and then that, if that moved into detection attribution. Yeah, we looked at this in a bit more detail because I realized in doing the original work that when we updated it, we, we got some different extra stations. There was people digitizing stations even in the 1980s, getting access to more data, putting more stations in. Um, we realized that the more sta if, you just, if you're just interested in the global average, there, was, there had to be a finite number of series that you could, you could use and get away with. But we were always interested in the, in the gridded product. And if you wanted to improve that, then you've got to improve the number of stations everywhere. So there was always a lot of stations in Europe and um, parts of the United States and parts of Australia and Japan and places. But obviously there was never the cover that good coverage in parts of Africa, South America and some parts of Asia. So we've always concentrated on trying to get more stations for the, for the less uh, well covered or areas of the world. So, but in 97 I did some work with Tim Osborne where we tried to sort of quantify what the number was that you needed. So in terms of, and we came up with this concept, I came up with this concept of the effective number of spatial degrees of freedom. So this is how many you need to actually produce an answer that's within the statistical error. And really for the land, it's probably less than a hundred stations well situated around the world. But obviously you don't have them all like that through time. So you don't have sort of many long records to choose from in Africa or South America and you certainly don't in the Antarctic. So, um, but that's the number if you did have a well distributed set of stations then about a hundred stations would would produce you the answer the, the, for the global average and it would be indistinguishable from um, the numbers we produce now. And the, in the latest data set in terms of combining with the marine data we're taking this concept a stage further. We're using this, 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 this bit of statistical theory to produce a hundred realizations of the, uh, the gridded data set and the hemispheric and global averages. So where you've got very few stations, 
those realizations will differ more from each other. So over Europe and North America, those realizations are almost the same because they're really robust. So it's, it's a way of quantifying the error in the data sets spatially as well. And that's really useful for, the, um, for some of the people working on detection attribution issues so that they can then compare with the Clement model output. Um, they've both got multiple models. So they're used to using multiple realizations of climate uh, simulations. And they've got multiple realizations of the observations as well to work with. And so they can, uh, they can use that, uh, that, uh, that way of displaying the error structure of the data. In terms of those realizations, the data set is a, is a gridded product on a five degree latitude longitude grid. Now, if you have um, sort of in some parts of Europe, North America, you've got 20 or 30 or more stations in a box. So that average is very well constrained. So there'll be a value. In, everything's done in terms of anomalies from 1961 to 90. So issues of elevation and distance from coast, etc., sort of disappear. Um, so the, uh, the more stations you have, the smaller the error will be. Um, and with, when you've got fewer stations, the error is larger. Obviously, you've got one station in a box. You've only got one measure. That's a, it's a large area, an individual box. So what you do is you know for that box the standard deviation. So you can draw samples from that, which are the realizations about how temperature might have varied in, in the past. And you know that those, how you, how you draw them is, is just basically random because there's very little sort of autocorrelation from one month to the next in most, most, of the, most parts of the world. I mean, most people who, who now collect the data just collect what they might think of as the, as the best estimate, which is the 50th percentile of those realizations. But it's very useful for the, um, for the climate modelers to compare their observations with, because they've got, they, they know they have a range of possibilities of how temperatures have varied in the past. Um, so they can use that, that concept that we've uh, added to the data set uh, in, in, in their analyses. Well, we, we don't do any of the measurements ourselves. All the measurements are made by um, mostly the Met Services of the world, or there are other organisations that do it in some countries, and we get access to that data. Um, now, the, there are a number of issues with the land stations. The, the marine data is far more interesting <laughs> and more important. Um, but the land stations, the, the, there are two main issues with the land stations. Um, and most of these differ from station to station. So they're not consistent problems from site to site. So as, as one particular site, you may have a several moves of that site from different places in the town, um, but they will be different from other places nearby. Uh, also, some, sometimes the observation times at stations change, and they might also be different from place to place. So what, ten, so what you need to do is you need to take into account these issues of site changes and observation time changes because they can make important, ish, prob, make important effects on, on, on the data. So for example, um, if, you, if you've been measuring temperatures and you've been measuring them three times a day, which was a common uh, way of doing it in the 19th century. Um, so you, the, the common thing was to start reading at sunrise, sometime at lunchtime, about one or two o'clock in the afternoon, and at sunset. So you have three observations. This was, this was the common practice in Europe in the, in the 18th, early 19th century. There were a lot of other issues related to that because Europe was not on, no, no place was on common time until the railways came. In the 18, we didn't get common time in Britain until about the 1830s when you needed to have common time, when you had a railway timetable. You didn't need it before then. So solar time, you were on solar time everywhere. So places were some way, in the larger countries, places were some way out from 
measuring on a common time schedule. But but just think of measuring it at at sunrise, one o'clock, and sunset. It's clearly going to vary during the year. You've got the seasonal cycle, but if you then suddenly switched when to, from doing that to moving to measuring it as daily maximum minimum temperatures when that thermometer became available in the middle of the 19th century, you probably have a one or two degree difference which might differ from, the, from month to month. There'd probably be a seasonal cycle to the difference. So you've got to take into account these different observation schedules and some of them are much more complicated than the simple example I've given you. There can be ones where uh, you've got measurements every three hours and then suddenly they decide that in that country that they've got these maximum minimum thermometers, they want to use those and they'll just measure that once a day. They just need the observer to go out once a day rather than every than eight times every three hours. So that that's the sort of observation time one. The other problem is that over the years a lot of sites have moved to uh, out outside of towns, uh, often to airports now. A lot of the readings are taken at airports. And so uh, you've got uh, potential jumps in records when sites have moved from city centre sites to airports. And you've got to take that into account. Mm. Well, we call the process of making sure we've got uh, just the, the impact of climate and weather on the observations. We don't want the effects of uh, human change in the schedule of measurements or where we've taken the measurements or even the screens that have been uh, built around the thermometers. We call that homogenization. Um, and uh, there's a well-known definition by a pair of climatologists in the 1940s called Conrad and Pollock who said a, a climate series is homogenous if it's only affected by the vagaries of the weather and climate. So we're, we're actually, uh, by, by analyses, uh, we're, we're making sure that these records are, are homogeneous. One or two people have this belief that there's somehow this master data set of temperature data or precipitation data out there which, which we draw on. Well, there isn't. We have we have accessed the data initially from World Weather Records, as I was saying at the beginning. We have then searched in archives, uh, particularly the Met Office archives, because they had a lot of archives from the British uh, Empire over the years, and measurements taken in many distant lands, so we've got those. Then we've had contacts with other scientists and other Met and Met services to try and get additional data, and uh, there's a there was a big impetus of getting extra data in 1950 um, after the Second World War, so the coverage improved a lot then. But there's still a lot more data out there that could be digitised in the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, which is, which is, which is coming along. There's been a big uh, emphasis recently to try and get more data digitised at the daily time scale and sub-daily time scale, particularly the pressure data, so that it can feed into new reanalysis products. That, but that also has helped in getting uh, some of the, um, the, the daily temperatures and rainfall also digitised. OK, so the different groups have got different data sets. Um, uh, so we have exchanged our data in the past with NCDC in Nashville. And that is the main American group in terms of, there are three American groups in uh, NCDC in Nashville and GIS, part of NASA in New York. And this new one uh, called BEST, with the somewhat contrived acronym Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature. Um, now, GIS, as far as I understand from reading the papers, uses the same uh, station data that NCDC uses. And they apply an additional adjustment for urbanization. But essentially, the data set is the same as what NCDC produces. Uh, best take a number of data sets from uh, NCDC. Now, they, having got the, the basic data together, they then, um, NCDC and BEST do some homogeneity assessment of that quality of the data and provide adjustments to the station data. Um, 
We're a bit different. We did some work on that in the 1980s and we realised that the best people to do that were the Met services themselves. So we've encouraged Met services to do it and more and more of them are doing it. It's more the developed nations that do it than the developing nations, so hardly any countries in Africa do it, for example. Um, um, so once you've got the basic data, the other difference is how you combine that into a grid or the hemispheric average. And uh, GIS uses one method, NCDC used another method, um, which is similar to ours now. And BEST uses a, a statistical interpolation scheme uh, involving uh, Kriging. But I don't think they make that, that aspect doesn't make much difference at all. I mean, uh, GIS and BEST managed to do it without having to have a base period for the station. So they get over, they somehow get over the problem of stations being at different elevations and also measuring temperature in different ways. But we, we use anomalies, so we have to have data, each station has to have uh, data, enough data for, from the 1961 to 90 period. So if we have a station that's only got 30 years in the 19th century, then we don't use it because it hasn't got the 1961 to 90 base period. The other techniques can you seem to be able to use that data, but I don't think there's much of that data. The biggest uh, issue with, with the, the global temperature series, and I'm talking here the global temperature is of land and ocean, is from the marine data. If you, if you go through the, quest, the answers I've given you so far in terms of uh, the land, a lot of the is issues are different from station to station. So they're not common from station to station. Urbanisation may be a slight factor in, in some regions of the world, but we think that's relatively small. But, and so if you average enough stations together, um, and they're reasonably reliable, the land record will agree quite well. Um, the land is always going to be much more noisier as well than the marine part. Now with the marine problem, the marine data and the work we've done on the marine data and particularly the work the Met Office has done on the marine data, um, there are a number of key changes to the way uh, temperatures were measured at sea in the past. First of all, the land data is all air temperatures measured one and a half to two meters above the ground. And so to measure air temperatures measured by ships, uh, the Met Office found that the the ship, the data during the daytime was just not, not very reliable. It was affected by the, the heating up of the ship, particularly when you had um, sort of modern, modern ships from the, well, steamships from the late 19th century onwards. So they, they removed the, the daytime data, and so that's half the data set to start with, so you've only got the nighttime ones. And so what we've always done is try to go to the sea temperature data. Um, and the reason for that is that sea temperatures, sea doesn't change much from day to day. So in a given square of the ocean, you don't need too many observations. So on a, on a land station, you need observations twice a day at least to pick up the diurnal cycle. And you need observations every day because it varies a lot from day to day in most parts of the world. But in the, in the marine part of the world, you can probably get away with three or four observations in a month it will give you the average sea surface temperature for that bit of the ocean because it doesn't change much from day to day. You're not measuring the immediate skin temperature of the ocean, you're measuring it some way about anywhere from the surface down to about five or six meters. So the top sort of top layer, that top layer of the ocean doesn't change too much. Um, but anyway, the way that measurement of sea temperature has been made has changed over the years, and particularly it changed around the start of the Second World War. What's done, what started the Second World War and continued since, is uh, measurements of sea temperature taken with engine intakes. So ships, steamships take on, or uh, powered ships in some way, take on water to cool the engines slightly, a bit in the analogous to how a car takes on air. And by putting some thermometers at the intake, at the sea intake pipe, then you can 
can have those measuring directly on the ship's bridge and it's much easier to do. So the captain or the mate can fill in the logbook without having to go and take a, 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 a real sample of seawater. Well, prior to the Second World War, most countries weren't doing that. Um, and the measurements were taken with a bucket. So there was a bucket of various designs, um, with a, obviously with a rope attached to them, and you, you throw the rope over the, the ship's side uh, and with the bucket on and you brought up some water and you put a thermometer in and you measured the temperature. And uh, the rules, the recommendations were that you left that thermometer in the bucket for a few minutes for the thermometer to equilibrate with the water. Well, depending on the bucket design, that water is going to cool because normally the air temperature is cooler than the seawater that's being sampled over most of the ocean. It's not everywhere, but it is in many places. And so there, will be a, there was a cooling. The bucket temperatures were tended to be somewhere between about 0.3 and 0.7 degrees Celsius cooler. And that jump, that, that change took place around 1940, 41. And so there's a massive jump in the sea temperatures if you don't adjust them for that homogeneity problem. In the sailing ship period in the 19th century, they were using buckets as well, and they tend to be wooden buckets, and they're better insulators, so they had slightly less of an evaporative cooling that, the, that, came, with steam, that came with steam ships. So if you, if you took the marine data and put it all together without doing these adjustments, you'd find that there was a massive temperature increase because the bucket data in the, from about 1890 to 1940 is about 0.5 degrees Celsius colder than it should be. And it's slightly warmer by a few tenths uh, in the late 19th century. And then you've got the modern stuff, which is nearer the true temperature. So if you didn't make that, that adjustment, you would have a massive warming much greater than you see over the land in the marine data. So the biggest adjustments to any of the components of the global temperature data is the sea temperature adjustments around the beginning of World War II. And if those adjustments were not made, then the, the air-sea temperature differences would just be totally, would be fine after World War II and then completely wrong before World War II. So you cannot use unadjusted data. So I, I put it in another context. context. There's, there's been a lot of, uh, I've, I've read things about the, um, the New Zealand temperature record and people claiming that the New Zealand Met Service, NIWA, um, have made adjustments to data going uh, back into the 19th century. Well, this is to account for the site changes. And so you end up with a record in New Zealand which shows relative warming throughout much of the 20th century. And that agrees with sea temperature measurements from the adjusted sea temperature data set around the coasts of New Zealand. If you didn't make the adjustments to the land data, the land data would have no warming. If you didn't make the adjustments to the marine data, the sea temperature would have about twice the warming it had currently has. And so everything in New Zealand before, before the Second World War would just be completely ridiculous because you'd have air-sea temperature differences that were totally, uh, totally wrong compared to the period uh, after the Second World War, roughly, because of the big adjustments to marine data. So really, the really important change, the biggest change to any of the components of the global temperature record is in the marine data for the change of, from buckets to intakes. And this is really important also the marine data changes are more important also in recent times too because the numbers of ships taking measurements around the world has reduced slightly. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, some shipping companies no longer want to do it. There's always been issues with fishing fleets not knowing, not wanting their competitors to know where they are. And the other thing is that ships think that some companies think that sending out the data with the call, ship's call sign tells pirates off Somalia where they are. So in order to improve though uh, 
before that, in order to improve uh, weather forecasting in the southern hemisphere and parts of the northern hemisphere, people realised that improvements to sea temperatures were really vital. And so since the late 1970s, a lot of buoys have been deployed around the world, particularly in the southern hemisphere and the tropics. And this provides, uh, these, these buoys provide uh, measurements of air temperature, sea temperature and pressure. It turns out that these um, buoy data, uh, the Americans call them buoys, um, tend to record temperatures slightly cooler than the ships of somewhere in the range of one to two tenths of a degree Celsius when, you, when they've compared co-located measurements. So over the last 20 or so years, we've gone from a, or maybe since about 19, yeah, maybe about the last 25 years, since about 1990, we've gone from a, a, a marine measurement, marine measurements coming almost entirely from ships, to one where about 80% of them are coming from these, from these buoys. And so they're now allowing for that in the, in the, in, in the data sets because you've got to take into account that, that the buoys have a slightly different absolute temperature, which is probably nearer the true one than the ship. So it may be that the ship intake measurements are probably um, about one to two tenths of a degree Celsius warmer than they should be, which is what a lot of people have said in the past. It doesn't make any difference this, this diff slight difference in absolute temperature doesn't really make too much difference to us because we're using temperature anomalies. It's only if you want to try and go back to the absolute measurements in terms of, of a real degree Celsius rather than just temperature anomalies. Yes, so we did some work on this sort of, the 1940s has always been an interesting period. Um, in terms of uh, the course of temperature change on a global basis. Um, but what you've got to bear in mind is that the first part of the 1940s was the Second World War and the number of observations um, was markedly reduced from what was available during the 1930s and certainly what was available in the 50s or even in modern decades as well. So the marine data is, is, has a greater error range. And in our realizations of global temperatures or gridded temperatures that I talked about earlier, that is encompassed, that greater uncertainty of the marine data is encompassed within that. It doesn't help also with the, um, there was a major El Nino event in 1940, 41, 42, which, uh, we would like to know a bit more about, um, but we've we've tried. The Met Office and others have tried really hard in trying to digitise as many ship observations that we can we can find ship logbook observations. Uh, so uh, almost all the extra British ships in during the Second World War were have been digitised in the last um, ten years or so. So they have improved coverage but mainly in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. There weren't too many British ships in the Pacific. Although we did notice one intriguing thing with the British ships, that uh, at the start of the Second World War, Britain, Churchill made a deal with uh, Roosevelt in that for giving the Americans uh, leases on bases around the world, we got a number of old American ships and these ships, uh, we hadn't got the parts for a lot of these ships, so when they needed repairs, you see suddenly see these British ships in the, in the South Indian Ocean suddenly shoot off to um, uh, San Francisco or Seattle for, for repairs. And you can see this in the logbooks. Um, and so there, are, there is some British data in the tropical Pacific, but very little. It's just when they had to go off for, for running repairs during the Second World War. Mm. Um, in terms of interesting questions, um, it's probably, for me, it's nothing much to do with the global temperature record. Um, I do wonder sometimes that when I did that in the 1980s, I should have moved on to something else, but it, it's obviously become a, quite a, a thing to keep, to keep going. Um, 
one one aspect is trying to get more data in, but knowing that it's only really going to help in certain parts of the world. Um, we have looked at other ways of combining the data. Um, we also doing a lot of work on trying to do similar data sets for precipitation, which is clearly a quite different variable to temperature. So when I said that a hundred stations would produce a reasonable global land temperature estimate for temperature, um, then for precipitation you would need you would need thousands and thousands because it's much more uh, much more spatially variable than, than temperature. Uh, and trying to get access to that sort of quantity of data is quite difficult. So you can only really produce reasonably reliable precipitation grids uh, in the data dense parts of the world. So you can get ideas of what might be happening in Africa, but it's, it's got such large error ranges attached to it. So we have produced another data set which uh, people say that the crew data set doesn't has gaps where there's no stations. That's true. But there's another data set we have that a lot of people don't know about, which is a, an, in, an infill data set where we do this infilling and, and we also do that for temperature and a few other variables too. Um, and that data set gets widely used by many people, particularly the climate modelers, to assess how their climate models are doing in an absolute sense because we put that back to absolute degrees Celsius too and rainfall in millimetres so they can compare how well their model is doing um, both over time and sort of things on the seasonal, seasonal cycle and um, many other aspects of uh, uh, the, the sort of agreement between temperature and rainfall and pressure to see if the model reproduces the same sort of patterns that the real world has. Uh, if I'm giving um, a talk in town X, it would be useful to know what the temperature record for town X looks like. Um, so the, the, that question was always asked. And then there was always be a question about urbanization. And people think urbanization causes much of the warming. But uh, urbanization doesn't cause warming of the marine data and the, the, the trends are pretty similar between land and marine data. Um, and another question people always asked about uh, is the issue, the issue we've already talked about is how many stations you need to produce reliable records. Now the fact that I said that you can get away with about 100 stations. That's at the monthly time scale. So the number you need is dependent on the time scale. So if you're looking at daily data for temperature, then you will need many more stations to do it reliably. And precipitation is a different variable entirely. It's much um, less spatially uh, uh, conforming. It's more spatially variable. So you need more stations. And as you go f further back in time to the pre-instrumental period when you start using proxy data from ice cores, corals, trees, etc. If, if that number was significantly more than 100, then you wouldn't be able to produce these reconstructions in the past. And obviously as you go further back in time on longer time scales, uh, onto the 1000 year and 10,000 year time scales that we think about with ice ages, then it seems that people are quite happy to accept one record from Greenland and one record from Antarctica about the course of um, ice ages over the last uh, million years. They're not worried about what happens elsewhere. So it's, it's time that the actual timescale dependence of a uh, number of these metrics is, and particularly this, this number of reliable, number of stations you need is, is, is crucial. And uh, I was, I think that's one of my best papers that I've ever done in 1997 with Tim on that issue. And uh, it's not been, the other groups do not, um, in, sort of, they're aware of that, but they've never really incorporated the error component in their data. The, the best people have, but I think their errors are too small. So 
the climate is going to continue to warm. Um, but it's not going to warm year on year because it, it hasn't done that in the past. There have been periods when it's warmed, there's been periods when it's cooled slightly, and there's large changes from year to year. So the, the climate change component from greenhouse gases is really on the decadal and longer time scales. You shouldn't see it on the, on the individual years. So what's really influencing the individual years is the circulation, which is where we started. Um, and it's really the, uh, the tropical circulation, El Ninos, La Ninas, that's the dominant one. But in different parts of the world, you've got other components from the, the North Atlantic Oscillation in, in Europe and North, North America. And you've got the Southern Annular Mode in the, in the higher latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere. So how that circulation changes has a, is a big component on the temperatures on the sort of in, in the interannual time scale. But that's just year to year. We wouldn't expect El Nino events and La Nina events to contrive to produce um, sort of a long-term warming. That really has to be down to greenhouse gases because we know that the, the sun has varied, but the, the variations in solar output are relatively small. And they should have caused the world to cool slightly since the 19, um, late 1950s. But in fact, that hasn't happened. Thank you.